Thank you for joining our Gatsi learning series on the Genetic, Environmental and Microbial Project. These learning sessions provide access to Canada's top IBD researchers and healthcare providers to strengthen knowledge about these diseases and to see the impact of research firsthand. At the end of this session, we'll be, we will be answering your questions, the ones submitted through the registration process and our live Q&A. Please note that today's session is recorded and will be available for replay. It was over a decade ago that Crohn's and Colitis Canada embarked upon a bold, innovative research initiative spawned by a simple question. Why does one person get Crohn's disease versus someone else? As an organization rooted in our promise to improve lives and to find the cures for Crohn's and colitis, this was a very exciting proposition. It would be a massive project like no other, with multiple phases involving thousands of people, not only in Canada, but around the world and the GEM project was born, the world's largest clinical study investigating the causes of Crohn's disease. Crohn's and Colitis Canada is thankful to our many generous donors and to the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust for believing in research like the GEM project and to the researchers who make these advancements possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker and the project leader of the GEM project. Dr. Ken Koideru joined the Division of Gastroenterology at Mount Sinai Hospital in January 2008. He completed medical school at McGill University in 1981 and then trained in internal medicine and gastroenterology from 1982 to 1986. He went on to do postdoctoral training as an MRC research fellow in mucosal immunology with Dr. John Bienenstock at McMaster University. On completion of this research training, he joined the Division of Gastroenterology at McMaster University in 1992, where he went on to serve as Training Program Director and Associate Director of the Division. He has held an Ontario Ministry of Health Career Scientist Award for 10 years and was one of the first recipients of a five-year Crohn's and Colitis Canada IBD Research Scientist Award. Dr. Koideru joined the Department of Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital as a clinician scientist and is a full professor of medicine at the University of Toronto in 2008. His research is focused on investigating the fundamental mechanisms of intestinal inflammation. Welcome Dr. Koideru and thank you for being here with us tonight. Nice to be on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. So yes, thank you, Mina, for that very nice introduction. And I'm uh, really um, happy to be here tonight to talk about the GEM project. Um, as much as I do talk about this, it seems I uh, uh, am uh, always willing to uh, talk and discuss the work that has been done by this team of uh, collaborators and researchers. Um, I, as opposed to just diving into the usual talk, I thought today I would start with this. Um, the adage that it's uh, difficult to raise a child without a village, I think applies very much to the GEM project. Um, as you will see soon, this, hap this all began over a decade ago. And uh, I really, <clears throat> at this time, have to stop and uh, acknowledge the uh, participation, support of many people across the country that helped uh, launch the project and have uh, contributed to the ongoing data generation and analysis. And uh, these are some of the faces <coughs> of those people. Um, I, can, I, I can talk about each one for uh, quite some time, but I would like to highlight um, the collaborators in, in um, the uh, GEM project uh, operating uh, committee. Um, it's asking me, okay. Uh, Paul Moetti and Ann Griffith, uh, who really have been there with, from the very beginning with me on uh, initiating the study. The members of uh, the steering committee who are depicted here below. Um, each representing a different faction of science in gastroenterology from across the country, and several members who have joined us from the United States and from Israel. Um, and then at the top here, Andrew Patterson on the left, and Wei Zhu next to him, and, Wei, and, and David Gutman, 
who really are at the core of our data generation and analysis team. They have really helped us make sense or try to make sense of the data that's coming forward from this uh, project. And then there are the people who actually do the work. Um, um, and here are the people who've invested a great deal of their time in actually looking at the data and trying to analyze and make sense of it. And these include uh, David Kevins, who is one of our IBD fellows, who's gone back to Ireland, um, Larbi Bedrani, uh, Juan Regoza Garay, William Turpin, and Sun Ho Lee, who really have led our data analysis team. Michelle Smith, who has been really a leader in keeping our group together, keeping them functioning and keeping them happy. In this uh, picture here at the right is Gila Sassan, who's now gone on to uh, Harvard to do a IBD fellowship. And Chaim Leibovitz, who's come to join us from Israel uh, as an IBD fellow. And the reason I show these uh, pictures is that in order to get this work done and to understand what the study is trying to teach us, you need these people to spend the time looking at the data, spending hours working with our statisticians and trying again to make sense of what this is trying to teach us. So the GEM project, we're gonna cover um, a few topics. We're gonna to discuss why did we start the GEM project? And the answer to that question is depicted by the logo here. It's because the Crohn's and colitis at the time called the foundation asked us to do this study. They challenged us with a proposal that would look at a human study that would directly try to answer the question, what causes inflammatory bowel disease? And in, our, and in this case, more specifically Crohn's disease. From there, we're gonna discuss a little bit about what it took to set the study up, build the infrastructure, the progress in the recruitment, how we are doing with our generating of the data, the sample analysis, I'll give you a little bit of taste of that. I won't get into too much detail and how this is going to be used to build the models that will help us understand who is at risk of developing Crohn's disease. So the question before us is what causes inflammatory bowel disease? And uh, many of you may have seen pictures of a colonoscopy and this is what we are dealing with. On the left uh, is patient colon who has ulcerative colitis and on the right Crohn's disease. And I'll just spend a little bit of time on the right one. It's this, these white areas between the pink that are the ulcerations and the damage of the lining of the colon that lead to the symptoms that we all well know. The intestinal um, bleeding, diarrhea, abdominal pain, etc. And the question is why does this happen? So all of this is occurring at the level of the lining of the colon. And these cartoons sort of depict what we think are, is involved here. So you can see that overlying the colonic mucosa are cells that form the epithelium. And it's a really a one cell lining where these cells are all held together and cover this the interior of our uh, wall of the colon, where you find all of the cells of the immune system. And this is set up so that one can see that if you were exposed to a microbe that is a potential damaging microbe, a pathogen, the immune system is going to try to defend against that pathogen. But if you stop and think about it, at the same time, the immune system has to be able to understand that there are some antigens, particularly food antigens, that are we are exposed to, that the immune system has to sort of control that response. We don't want to be overacting to that response. So in health, there is a nice balance between the, the defense and this ability to tolerate what are non-threatening antigens. So when we stop to think about what is it that happens that is might lead to inflammatory bowel disease. This is the usual Venn diagram that we show. The uh, disease usually occurs in a, an individual who may have a genetic susceptibility. 
Um, certain genetic mutations have been defined and we're not going to discuss them tonight. That genetic susceptibility somehow allows for something in the environment or something within the microbes in the intestinal, uh, in the gut lumen to activate the immune response in a way that there is an uncontrolled inflammatory response with the damage. So this is a simplified view of what might be going on, but it is far more complex than that. And all I'm showing here is a contour plot in three dimensions, just to start to add to the, that complexity. And this just looks at the interaction between the immune response, the bugs or the microbial ecology, and that barrier, that epithelial barrier that is in between the two, trying to control that immune response. So when we think about the environment, we look around the world and we have observed as was depicted in this paper by Gil Kaplan and his colleagues, that the incidence of ulcerative colitis really has been changing over time. Initially in the Western world, as shown in the uh, red bars, uh, but then more recently in the newly industrialized countries, most particularly I think modeled in um, East Asia and China, where we see a second wave, it's a bad term these days, but the second wave of an increase in ulcerative colitis. What this is telling us is that there must be something in the environment that has changed in these countries, initially in the Western world, and now more recently in the newly industrialized countries. What is it in the environment is really unknown. These are a number of those environmental factors that we have been considering. And you probably all have heard how we think that there may be something in the diet. We don't know what it is. There may be something in how we are overly sanitizing ourselves that changes the way we deal with our um, world such that there may be uh, an inability of the immune system to control its response to, uh, to bugs. Uh, perhaps it's uh, related to sun exposure, smoking, psychological stress, uh, exposure to certain medications. All of these things have been looked at and there may be evidence for some of them, some stronger evidence like for smoking and Crohn's disease, but less strong evidence for other of these environmental factors. Nonetheless, it's clear there's something in that environment that helps trigger this disease. And this is an example of what is changing in, uh, in China, where we have seen a, uh, quite a dramatic increase in uh, the incidence of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And this individual is eating a cheeseburger and it is suggested that the westernizing of the diet in China may be contributing to this. But that is still a hypothesis yet to be proven. So the challenge for us is that if we're going to try and cure this disease, we need to identify and understand what triggers this, this, this disease. Triggers or causes it. And if we identify these triggers, try to understand how that actually causes the disease is the next challenge. But it's only through this that we can develop new strategies that might help us in a preventing the disease, treating the disease once it's established and perhaps even curing it. So that was our challenge when we started to put together the GEM project. In preparing for this talk, I, <clears throat> I went back and, and dug up some old files and came across a, a, um, a talk that we that I uh, used as part of our GEM project planning meeting. This was in 2005 or 2006. And here's that uh, agenda from that meeting. It was held on June 23rd, 2005, where we started to look at what the uh, challenge was before us and what were the goals of trying to develop a project that might try to answer this question of what's the cause of Crohn's disease. And I won't go into the details of that meeting, but I'll tell you it was quite an interesting um, discussion that uh, led to defining exactly what the question is that we were going to try and answer in this study, what would be the best approach, defining the protocol, in other words, the experiment, who we were going to uh, collect as part of the cohort or the individuals that we were going to study and follow, and then formalizing the actual writing of the application, the timeline, the budget, etc. 
And this is actually a picture or, um, of, of the front page of that application to Crohn's and colitis that we submitted in 2006. And that was for the initial award of $5 million. And that went to a review panel and back and forth, we responded to reviewers and eventually we were awarded the, uh, the funds in 2007. And uh, it was contingent upon us recruiting the first subject in 2008. And I'll tell you, meeting that wasn't easy. The basic premise of that study is depicted in this very carefully handwritten graph. If you look at someone who has Crohn's disease, and on the x-axis, this horizontal line, you look at time, obviously the disease activity goes from zero or minimal to very high disease activity. And then their disease may go up and down, fluctuate, it may stay uh, quite chronically active, or it may improve over time, perhaps as a result of either medical therapy or surgery. When all of this is going on, so in the yellow and in the bluish areas, there is a lot that's changing in the gut that is uh, almost as much a result of the inflammation as opposed to the cause of the inflammation, making it very difficult to dissect out what might have triggered that disease. So the premise of the GEM project was that we needed to go back in time and study individuals with Crohn's disease essentially before they develop the disease, back here where this purple arrow is. So that was the basic premise, and this is referred to as a prospective cohort study. So uh, without getting into all the details how we came to these numbers, we decided that what we needed was to recruit individuals at high risk, and these high-risk individuals were identified by virtue of the fact that they were a first-degree relative of someone with established Crohn's disease. And we focused on Crohn's disease because the familial history is much higher for Crohn's than ulcerative colitis. One can do the same thing for ulcerative colitis. It just may take 10 times as many people to do this and 10 times as much money. So this initial study was focused on Crohn's because we could we thought it'd identify a group of people depicted here where the individual who develops Crohn's in red would be easier to find within that group of high-risk individuals. Recruiting 5,000 individuals, we predicted would be able to give us at least 70 individuals who would develop disease in time as we watch them over um, the uh, duration of the uh, study. And having 70 new cases, and four of the individuals who stayed healthy as matched controls, we thought we would be able to identify a parameter that was associated with risk of developing disease at least two and a half fold over the baseline risk. And what we did is we asked each subject, once we, we, we identified who they were and they were willing to participate, to do questionnaires that talked about environmental risk, their diet, we got blood for their genetics, stool sample for their uh, microbiome analysis. We got blood to uh, measure uh, immune responses, serology, and uh, peripheral blood lymphocyte responses. And we did a intestinal permeability, which I will describe to you in a little more detail. So that essentially was done on everybody who was uh, recruited into the study at a time when they were healthy. They had to have no GI symptoms. Um, otherwise, you know, they may already have had uh, the disease, uh, but just not uh, diagnosed as yet. And then we followed them over time. To start this recruitment, we initially started in Canada, expanded to the United States, Europe. Uh, we included Sweden, Australia, and New Zealand. We tried to involve France, but that just never happened for a number of reasons. But for the most part, this is a global network of recruitment centers. So this is uh, what's happened since we started in 2008. Uh, it's now 12 years. We have 12, uh, 5, just over 5,100 subjects who have been recruited into the GEM. Um, and of those 5,100, as we've continued to watch this group of individuals, 
95 have developed Crohn's disease. Interestingly, 21 of these individuals also, uh, not also, but developed ulcerative colitis. So although we were looking for new Crohn's, a number of these individuals did develop ulcerative colitis. So this is what the uh, cohort looked like. This is the countries they came from. Uh, the mean age was about just under 17 years of age. Um, the male-female split. 70% are siblings of an individual with Crohn's, whereas 30% were an offspring of an individual with Crohn's. The group that developed the group that developed Crohn's disease is depicted here. You can see the countries that they came from. Uh, the, those that developed ulcerative colitis are below. Uh, in terms of those that developed Crohn's disease, 80% were siblings versus uh, offspring. About a 50-50 split male and female. The average age at diagnosis was 20. And just to remind you, we were recruiting individuals from age six to 35. And more importantly for us was the time between or between the time of recruitment and the development of disease was over three years. So what we were looking for is we didn't want to be recruiting someone who developed disease within a month or two because it may be that whatever we were measuring may be reflecting the presence of Crohn's disease already established, but just not diagnosed. So having a cohort of individuals who go on to develop Crohn's disease, as well as some who are remaining healthy, we can then compare whatever marker we're interested in, in those that develop Crohn's to the healthy controls. And we can try to understand if the sig there is a signature that distinguishes an individual, a healthy first degree relative, uh, that is going to be at high risk for developing Crohn's as compared to those that are low risk for developing Crohn's. So I'm gonna focus on some of our data on the intestinal permeability that was uh, that is about to be published in the, the uh, gastroenterology journal. And then I'll talk a little bit about the microbiome composition data that we have as part of a paper that has just been submitted for publication. But as you can see, there are many other data generation ongoing that we will be looking at over the uh, next six months. So the epithelium, this is uh, the cover of uh, the journal Nature Medicine uh, for a paper written by Jerry Turner, who was um, chair of pathology in Chicago, who's a, um, an expert on the uh, basic understanding of how epithelial cells actually uh, hold hands and form that barrier in the, in, the, in the intestine to separate the outside or the gut lumen from the inside. To put another way, the lining of the gut, as I showed you before, involves a number of cells that are sort of lined up as single cells. And they're stuck together by what are referred to as tight junctions, these red and blue and brown molecules. And that holds these things together in a pretty tight monolayer or a pretty tight um, sort of uh, covering of the, uh, of the intestine. And if you make a hole in that covering, you can imagine how things could leak through the barrier, through the epithelial barrier. And in fact, other than the obvious thing that someone who has bad inflammation and ulceration is having a lot of leakage, what about those individuals who are not sick yet, do not have disease? Is there a change in that barrier function that we can measure? And this talks to the fact that we can use sugar molecules here, mannitol and lactulose, as a way to sort of test whether this barrier function is intact. Mannitol sort of sneaks across cells. It's a smaller molecule, so it gives you a sense of the surface area. Whereas lactulose, which is a larger sugar molecule, only gets across if there is a disruption of this tight junction between cells. So we can give someone a drink with these two sugars, come back and get their urine the next day, and we can measure the relative amount of mannitol and lactulose 
as a reflection of whether that barrier is intact. So this is what we did in these um, in all of these subjects who were recruited to the GEM project, at least everyone who agreed to do it. Prior to this, although people had talked about altered barrier function, no one had ever shown that it precedes the development of disease or even predicts the development of disease. So this graph shows that if you look at those individuals who have a normal barrier function, this sort of red line, uh, the incidence free probability means that these individuals are less likely to develop Crohn's disease over time. And this is a time of nine years. The individuals who are depicted in this blue line are those individuals who had an elevated or abnormal barrier, in other words, a leaky gut. And you can see that they actually, there was a, a much larger accumulation of individuals who developed Crohn's disease in this group. And when you compare these two, you can actually calculate what is referred to as a hazard ratio, which means that those that have elevated barrier function, um, uh, elevated uh, permeability, an abnormal barrier, are about three times or more li likely to develop Crohn's disease over time. So this is the, actually the first time that anyone has actually formally shown that abnormal barrier function is the predictor of Crohn's disease and exists before the disease is actually present. This is the uh, cartoon abstract that the uh, publication actually put, put together to help explain the results of this study. Um, even for the scientists, we had to simplify this. So this is a common thing now in, in scientific papers. And it just shows that if you uh, take the solution and we measure your barrier function, if you have a normal barrier, you're more likely to remain healthy and asymptomatic. But if you have a leaky gut, you're more likely to develop Crohn's disease. And this is uh, after a median of about 7.9 years. So with this, we now have at least one of several uh, markers that we can use to predict who will go on to develop disease. It's not an absolute predictor, but it increases your likelihood over and above the uh, genetic or familial risk if you are a first degree relative. We then next turn to the microbiome. So the microbiome is a term used to describe all of the uh, microbes that are present in the gut. Um, as you can imagine, it's quite a complex ecological niche. Um, this uh, electron microscope pictures has been uh, colorized uh, for our entertainment, but it shows all the different bugs sort of in interspersed between cells um, within the gut. The question is, how can you analyze uh, the type of microbes that are present in, this, in the stool sample, for example, to understand whether there are any changes that are related to the development of Crohn's disease? So to understand this, I have to give you a little bit of basic um, biochemistry uh, slash gene sequencing. Um, the old fashioned way of examining what bugs are in any sort of uh, niche uh, in the urine, if you have a urinary tract infection or in the gut, used to be having to culture the bugs, which is very cumbersome and very limited. A lot of bugs are difficult to culture, so you don't really know everything that is within your sample. What we now are doing is using next generation sequencing techniques and actually sequencing one of the genes that is present in all bacteria called the 16S uh, RNA gene. As this gene allows us through understanding the sequence to determine which bugs are actually there. So you can actually define the different bacteria or what we refer to as the different taxa within a sample. So we can understand what the composition is of the bacteria in that sample. I'm not gonna talk about this, but this is shotgun sequencing on the right, where you can actually sequence all of the genes that are coming from bacteria so that you can uh, not only know what composition or what bacteria are there, but actually what they are doing, what genes they have, what function those genes have, and perhaps how the combination of bugs are actually influencing the physiology of the gut. 
So that is work that is ongoing, but I'm not talking about those results today. I'm going to focus on our analysis of composition using 16S. So the results of that are shown here. And as you can see, this is even with the 16S alone, this is quite a complex data set to try and tease apart. So to simplify it, I will tell you about the jelly bean wars. Um, one of our first papers we published in Nature Genetic, they had a front cover where they used these jelly beans to try and explain what it is we were trying to do by doing this type of sequencing analysis. So if you have a jar of jelly beans, it's very hard to know if those that jar is any different than another jar of jelly beans. It's just a, a, a complete mix. If you use some uh, software to analyze the 16S sequencing I just talked to you about, you can actually start to separate your jelly beans or your bacteria into different colors or different classes or what are referred to as genera. So you can see that there are blue and green. And in the, in the gut lumen, there are about 250 different taxa to look at. Even when you do this, it's still hard or difficult to know if there are um, comparing uh, 5,000 subjects, uh, each with their own jar of jelly beans, whether they all have the same, same amount of blue jelly beans or green jelly beans. You can imagine the complexity involved. But that's what we needed to do to understand that if the jar of jelly beans is different in someone who goes on to develop Crohn's disease versus someone who remains healthy. And this is where we come to what many of you read about in the newspapers is using artificial intelligence or machine learning. And um, in preparing this, I sort of asked myself, what's the difference of those two terms and actually Googled it. And this is what I came up with. Uh, artificial intelligence just uh, refers to the technology which enables a machine or a computer to simulate human behavior or human thinking about solving a problem. Machine learning is how that machine will undertake that challenge. In other words, it's the algorithms that are used by the machine or the computer to try and solve a problem. And the problem I have here is, tell me which jars of jelly beans are different. Um, I'm not gonna go into that. I'm gonna show you what we did with our data that we've uh, just submitted for publication. And this is a bit complex, but I think it'll set the stage. Each taxa, for example, this taxa here, we looked at the differences in the relative abundance or how many of that taxa are present within our samples that are different in those who go on to develop Crohn's versus those who remain healthy. And we use those differences to say whether this taxa actually helps define who's going to be at higher risk. And each taxa sort of contributes to that risk assessment to a different degree. And that analysis is done by this machine learning, these algorithms that keep churning at the data until we start to see the patterns emerge. And the patterns are not simply a linear relationship. They're actually quite a complex um, relationship where there are uh, interactions between many of the taxa as well. So there's another uh, level of complexity. So all of this is uh, sort of thrown into the machine and the machine spits out this list or this ranking of which taxa contribute most to the apparent risk of your future development of Crohn's. And that algorithm essentially produces a, uh, uh, an equation, if you like, that we can then use and apply to a group of individuals where we don't know whether or not they will go on to develop disease. So that's what we did is we took that algorithm, we took that equation, and we applied it to our subjects who were recruited in the GEM project. And here you can see that those who had a low risk defined by the, their microbial composition, had a much lower risk of developing Crohn's disease. And those that had the higher risk score had a much higher risk with, again, a hazard ratio that was over two. So there's an over twofold increased risk if you have a collection or a compositional change that is of the higher risk type. And having, if I go back for a minute, the list, whoops, if I go back for a minute, if I have 
the list of which tax had contributed more to that risk score, we can now begin to ask what is different or what is unique about these specific bacteria and how they may contribute to the onset or the risk of developing Crohn's disease. And not only that is with that information, can we now sit and generate a um, treatment uh, strategy, such as taking a bug and a pill to regenerate a normal microbiome or reset the microbiome? And editing the microbiome is something that many individuals are looking at quite seriously. Um, editing uh, involves considering changes in diet using probiotics. You've all heard, I'm sure, of fecal transplants, which is another uh, way to try to uh, change the microbiome. Um, defining specific microbes that maybe we should be targeting, as opposed to communities of microbes that we want to change. And there are molecular ways of editing microbes where you can actually edit specific strains of a given bacteria to maybe change its function that may help in making it a uh, low risk microbe versus a high risk microbe. And then looking at how microbes actually alter the immune response is a whole other um, uh, line of investigations that we have yet to, uh, to embark on uh, and people are thinking of vaccines. Um, and I've only talked about bacteria here, but it is you know, possible that there may be microbes that are viral in nature or uh, fungal in nature that contribute to this equally well. So what we have here is we've looked at uh, at least two parameters today, the intestinal permeability change or barrier uh, dysfunction that predicts disease and the microbiome composition that predicts disease. And we are going to uh, be looking at other of these parameters individually and looking at how they interact with each other to further define how to separate individuals into a high risk versus a low risk group. In the future, uh, we will be able to uh, stratify an individual's risk using these parameters. Um, we will probably end up with a very complex uh, model uh, more than in three dimensions that will help identify this risk but also identify which parameters of these risks are working in a given individual and this leads to this notion of personalized medicine where not everyone's Crohn's disease developed in the same way. We need to expand this using other cohorts that are being collected around the world and there are a number of collaborations that are ongoing and then we, look, we need to look at how to target uh, these discoveries to, to reestablish disease or prevent disease from happening. And that uh, three-dimensional contour plot I showed you, to be able to navigate that, I think machine learning will help show us the way. So not only are we seeing major changes in technology such as next generation sequencing, but we're also looking at changes in our ability to uh, analyze the data, new approaches to the bioinformatics and statistics. So with that, I just uh, would like to thank the individuals of our steering committee who I've shown you already, um, the many recruitment center directors from around the world who help uh, identify and recruit the subjects we need for the study, uh, the individuals uh, who I've uh, pointed out to you who are involved in the data analysis and the day-to-day -day work at uh, digging through um, the uh, gold mine of data that we are uh, able to uh, collect through the GEM project. And of course, the Crohn's Colitis Canada, who've been with us since the beginning, over uh, 12 years now. Um, Helmsley Charitable Trust, uh, who have been mentioned, of course, some funding from the CIHR as well. And then, of course, all of the participants in the different centers who agreed <clears throat> to participate to encourage their first degree relatives who are healthy to get involved in a study that required them to give blood, urine, and stool. Not easy things to do when you're actually healthy. But really, it is their participation that has allowed us to get to this point and, and hopefully provide you with uh, new and uh, uh, game-changing information in this field. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm more than happy to address some of the questions that uh, we've received. So I'll turn it over to the moderator.
Thank you, Ken. Um, that was a, a fascinating presentation, and I'm sure our audience members were um, very much appreciative of that. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A period, um, we thought we would take a poll of the audience. So Sarah, if you can just open up the poll. Um, we wanted to have a sense of who the audience members are. And so uh, first thing we wanted to ask is if you're living with an inflammatory bowel disease, which of the following um, do you have? So Sarah's gonna put up the poll. Hope um, you can participate. There you go. So Sarah, let us know when you're gonna close the poll so we can get a sense. Okay, um, so I see the vast majority of the audience members um, have Crohn's disease, uh, which makes sense that since this is the GEM project. So thank you for um, participating in that poll. Sarah, do we have another poll or are we moving on? We are, okay, here we go. We also wanted to ask the question, uh, how many of you are act in the audience are actually participating in the GEM project right now? So uh, Sarah, if you can um, start that poll for us to get a sense of how many of the audience members are actually participating in the GEM project. Okay, I just got a text message from Sarah, will launch soon. Okay, so Sarah's saying something's wrong with our poll system right now, so maybe we can come back and ask that question. Uh, so what we'll do then is um, move right along to the Q&A period. What we've done for our Q&A session, like all our GLSs and our, all our webinars is, um, all the registrants of this webinar have asked questions ahead of time during registration. So we've compiled all those questions and came up with themes and have developed questions based on that. You're also welcome to put in questions in the chat box and hopefully we'll be able to get around to both. So Sarah, the first question, please. Okay. Looks like we might be having some challenges today. <laughs> So let me see, I have a backup of the um, slides. I need to open it up though. Okay, um, so the first question is, there we go. How can I take part in the GEM project study or other similar studies? So um, as of now, we have stopped recruiting for the GEM project. So we've hit our magic 5,000 and we've overshot our predicted 70 with new onset Crohn's disease. So we have a lot of data that we have to work through right now. Um, whether we come back to recruiting any new subjects in the future, um, time will tell. We have uh, the cohort that we currently have recruited that we continue to monitor for new diagnoses. And for example, in the last, I think, six months, we've had six individuals who've developed Crohn's disease. So individuals are still going on to develop Crohn's disease and still unfortunately uh, for them but fortunately for the study providing us with new insight and information and new numbers to look at but uh, in terms of uh, participating it's those of individuals who are already in this in the uh, study that if we call you because something's changed we uh, ask you to be one of the healthy cohorts or you've developed disease and we are asking you for uh, samples again uh, we thank you for that, but that's how you can participate for the time being. Thank you very much for that, Ken. Uh, next question, Sarah.
Okay. I see Sarah's telling me that the poll is working now, so maybe we'll uh, go to advance to the polls. The question is, are you a participant of the GEM project? A simple yes or no question. Okay, uh, interesting. So the majority of you are not a participant of the GEM project. So um, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I um, Obviously, this was an area of interest for you. And um, I think Dr. Kurturu probably answered a lot of questions that you might have had on the GEM project. OK, so the next question then, Sarah. All right, so should I read the question? What are the specific sure. genes responsible for the development of Crohn's and colitis? Well, that's another hour lecture or more. There are over 220, probably more than that right now, uh, genes uh, or mutations of genes that are associated with the risk of developing Crohn's uh, or ulcerative colitis, and some that are involved in both. Um, some have a very strong effect and some have a, a sort of weaker effect. So it's... Uh, interesting that there are many of these genetic associations, but to say that any one gene is responsible for the development of Crohn's, we have not found that gene yet. The gene with the largest association is called NOD2, and even that gene is present in a lot of people who are walking around who are healthy. So it's one of those things we still have to figure out. How do these genes contribute to the development of Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, so I don't know, Sarah, if your internet's working better and you can advance, there we go. The next okay. question. Okay, now we're on a roll. Yes. Um, diet. Um, there are uh, any known indicators from diet that can cause or trigger Crohn's disease? And are there specific diets that people can use to prevent triggering Crohn's disease? I'd love to be able to give you the answer for that. We don't have that answer. There are a lot of uh, diets that are thought to be um, bad for you in, in, in regards to the development of inflammatory bowel disease and diets that are thought that may have some benefit. And probably the one of, uh, one of the diets that is most widely discussed is this Mediterranean diet, uh, which is, as you can imagine, probably less in, in meats and, and higher in vegetables and many other things. And there was a recent paper within the last month that was published looking at the uh, Mediterranean type diet in its relationship to uh, the development of Crohn's disease. So this may be something that helps uh, prevent the disease. Um, it's hard to uh, really say for certain that uh, if you're not on a Mediterranean diet, it's gonna cause Crohn. Um, the second part of this is very interesting because um, you can imagine trying to uh, actually design a study to look at a diet and its ability to prevent Crohn's would take many, many years. It's taken us over 12 years to collect a cohort of individuals where only, only 90 have developed disease. And if you're trying to prevent a portion of that 90 with a diet intervention, it's going to be a very long and difficult um, clinical study to actually execute. But what we are looking at doing is with the information we have, where we have these um, parameters or markers that define your high risk of developing Crohn's, we're looking at whether diets or any intervention, but we're looking first at a diet, whether a diet can actually change some of these parameters. Because if we can show that, that it changes your microbiome or it changes your barrier function or changes any one of these other parameters, then we may have something to work on and uh, invest in actually showing whether that specific diet makes a difference in preventing disease. So since you talked about the Mediterranean diet, uh, would that be one of the interventions that you might be, uh, consider studying, Dr. Kutura? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think the, uh, the issue is in a Mediterranean diet and uh, people have assigned uh, diet types uh, into Mediterranean type and other types and actually have created a, uh, a, a Mediterranean score, a score of a Mediterranean type diet. It's not clear what in that Mediterranean diet may or may not be the actual 
um, good or bad component. So uh, there's uh, different ways of doing this. You go back and look at the diet data that we have, and we've started to look at lumping that diet into different types of diet without calling it a Mediterranean diet. We just allowed the differences in the patterns of diets to separate each other out and look to see if there's any association with the risk of Crohn's. And this is work that has been done by uh, one of the uh, former IBD fellows. And we have seen a pattern of diets that seems to be associated with less risk and a pattern of diets associated with a higher risk. But we're still working through that data set. So, you know, a Mediterranean diet or something like a Mediterranean diet may be the way to go. But I wouldn't want to say you should all go out there and. Um, you know, Mediterranean diet is probably good for you anyways, but to say that that's going to make a difference to Crohn's, um, I can't say that right now. So when can we expect uh, to hear some of the uh, results of that study that you just mentioned? Well, we're hoping, we're doing a, a pilot study with a group in Israel right now. Uh, it's not quite a Mediterranean diet, but it is a diet intervention. We're uh, most interested to see whether we can change any of these parameters I've talked about today. And we're looking at hopefully about two years before we're uh, going to be able to analyze that data. And if I can put a plug in for those of you who are involved in the uh, GEM project, some of the centers will be, uh, some of the GEM project centers will be involved and a selection of individuals will be approached to ask whether they'd be interested in doing or participating in a diet study. Yeah. So this is something we're just in the process of organizing now. And how are you planning on selecting the participants? Are there certain parameters that they have to fit or just so anyone who's... Be... Go ahead, please. Yeah, I mean, it's a... we can talk about this as a complicated design, but we're looking at um, people who are in the GEM project uh, who we have the uh, data on their microbiome, their uh, fecal calprotectin, uh, their uh, gut permeability, uh, a number of these parameters which we are showing now are related to risk, but they have not developed Crohn's as yet. So we're going to use those parameters to define who is a higher risk within the group, and those are the individuals we're going to approach for participation in the study. Okay, thank you for that. Next question, Sarah. What causes yeah. leaky gut syndrome? So this is uh, one of those, uh, you know, million dollar questions. Um, first of all, I'm not sure I agree with this terminology of a leaky gut syndrome. There is leaky gut, as I showed you. Uh, whether there's any symptoms related to uh, a leaky gut is not clear. All we've shown is that the leaky gut or the increased permeability is associated with an increased risk of future development of Crohn's. So uh, talking to that, what causes <clears throat> abnormal barrier function is a very good question. We've looked at the genetics of those individuals who have abnormal or you know, altered barrier function, leaky gut. We've looked at their microbiome composition to try and identify, is there a difference in microbiome that's associated with the leaky gut? I'll tell you that uh, our data has not shown a, a genetic risk yet, but we think there may be a microbiome signal associated with leaky gut. And it is unclear wh whether, you know, which is the chicken and which is the egg in that interaction. Uh, so there may be other, um, um, you know, exposure, environmental exposures that lead to leaky gut. So it's, uh, for example, using aspirin or what's called NSAIDs or those kind of medications can cause damage to the gut barrier. So it may be that or other medications or other exposures that could contribute to a leaky gut. So we don't have the answer. Um, about 20% of healthy first degree relatives have a leaky gut. Uh, people who have inflammatory bowel disease, it's a much higher uh, number, of course, but that's not a big surprise because their gut is damaged. But I think the interesting uh, part for us here is that this abnormality exists before disease is present. Uh, Sarah, next question. 
Okay, maybe, um, Ken, yeah, I, I think, think you partially answered this. So maybe we can move on to the next question, Sarah. So are that's the good. findings from this research relevant to people living with UC? I think that's a very common question that we get. So hoping you can um, provide some answers. Yeah, I think uh, it is a very important question for us. Obviously, the way the study was designed, it was designed to ask the question or answer the question in Crohn's disease. But as I told you, 21 individuals in the study developed ulcerative colitis. So although we separate people into Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, it's a little bit of uh, an artifact of how little we understand about the disease. There are some people where it's very clear that you have one, not the other. There's some people who have a disease there, it's hard to really be sure which it is. Um, and the fact that uh, 21 of these healthy first degree relatives of patients with Crohn's disease go on to develop ulcerative colitis is yet another uh, reflection of that, that, that sort of uh, overlap. Um, we are going to, at uh, some point, when our data for the Crohn's disease is uh, finalized, look at the same sort of thing in those ulcerative colitis patients that, uh, that have emerged in this cohort. The numbers are kind of small, so it's harder to be able to do this kind of analysis. But we have done a uh, project where we've looked at stool from these individuals <coughs> and used a uh, animal model to see if we can identify, is there a microbial trigger that uh, can confer a ulcerative colitis type change in, in uh, animal models. So that is a study that's just started so we were waiting the results excuse me thank you so, ken uh, excuse me very relevant but still to be defined wonderful thank you ken you know um, i'm looking at the clock and i see it's it's past eight uh, this webinar is supposed to end at eight um, but uh, i think we have at least another five questions to go which unfortunately we won't be able to cover all during the session. I think this is an indication that we would love to invite you again to give us an update, maybe in a year's time or whatnot, um, to let us know what's happened, whether you're closer to having a definitive predictive tool and so forth. So with that, um, thank you so much, Dr. Corturo, for coming. Um, Sarah, if you can advance to the final slides. Okay, as Sarah's advancing to the other questions, as I indicated, um, we did have a number of questions that the uh, registrants provided. And uh, so I'm just gonna move along and um, talk, uh, end the session um, and say that, um, that uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada is proud to be driving game-changing research thanks to the passion and curiosity of Canadian researchers like Dr. Ken Cruturo and his team combined, of course, with the generous support and patience of our donors. Um, it has been a long journey, as Dr. Couture indicated, 12 years, uh, but very proud that our supporters, our donors, um, have been behind us for these 12 years and to support Dr. Couture and his outstanding team to, um, and I believe it's been worth it. And so we're very much looking forward to um, seeing what else um, what other results that you can share with us, Dr. Kurtu, maybe in a year's time? And uh, so with that, I'd like to move on to um, the final slide where we're gonna, we always end with putting in some plugs for our future webinars. Our next Gutsy Learning Series is on November 26th on IBD symptom management and EIMs. Uh, we will also be holding a COVID-19 and IBD webinars. We have two scheduled uh, for the remainder of this calendar year, one on November 19th and one on December 3rd. So please stay tuned. Uh, we, we hope you can join us. And last, please remember to take our very brief survey of tonight's presentation. Crohn's and Colitis Canada strives to provide helpful education sessions and your feedback helps us to ensure that we are providing what you need. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you.